Welcome to the first edition of Policy Talks by the African Space Leadership Institute. My name is Etimo Fiong and I am your host. The African Space Policy and Strategy were adopted by the African Heads of States and Governments in 2016. Subsequently, the African Space Agency was established in 2018 with the hope that it will become operational in 2023. It's about seven years since the adoption of the policy and strategy instruments. Are they due for a review? What is the status of the domestication and implementation of the instruments at national and regional levels? Have the instruments been effective in the decision-making programs and partnerships of the African Union? Our guest is Dr. Vlanathan Bonsami, currently the advisor to the Saudi Space Commission. He was a former CEO of the South African National Space Agency and chaired the African Union Space Working Group that drafted the African Space Policy and the African Space Strategy. Dr. Monsami, thank you for joining us. Most likely due to your successes in South Africa, the African Union now invited your requested that you should come and assist in developing the continental space policy and strategy. Did you follow the same process or since it's now continental with different countries, are there other things that you took into consideration which made you to follow a different um, framework? Yeah. So I, I think there's two points to note. The word that you use is process. Yes, we use exactly the same process but the content is very different because the context is very different. And I've seen this in many African countries where, or many countries, let's put it that way, where it's a cut and paste, and that's defeating the whole purpose of the process. Okay? Um, the process is meant to unearth what the policy priorities of the country is and how space can contribute. Okay? And there's a from that perspective, you define the user requirements and then you define what the strategy should be looking like, okay, what the priorities should be and what the strategy looks like. We've used the same on the African content, uh, context. We knew there's an agenda 2063, very similar to the SDGs. In fact, there's very close alignment between the agenda 2063 and SDGs. Okay. So we knew what the priorities of the continent looked like. And by the way, there were many different strategies as well. Like there's the maritime strategy for Africa. There's strategies on education and so on. So you kind of understand what the policy landscape looks like in Africa. And the question you have to ask yourself then is how can space contribute to giving effect to those policies and strategies? And one of the exercises we did as the, you know, we were doing the work for the working group and I think it's published as well. If you look at the commission, the African Union Commission, I think at the time there was about eight different commissions. And if you take the strategic objectives of each of these commissions and if you unpack them, you will realize that close to 90% of the work of the African Union Commission actually required space science and technology. So it's very user-driven, sort of focused, even the African space policy and strategy. And so very similar approach, but the context in terms of priorities is slightly different. So yes, we use the same process. Interesting. And the policy and strategy documents were adopted in 2016 by the heads of state. Yeah. Uh, and in their decision, the heads of state actually requested, and I quote, the African Union Space Working Group to develop the following. The one, the framework for the implementation of the African Space Policy and Strategy and two, the governance framework that covers the relevant legal requirements and protocols for an operational African outer space program. So we seem to hear more about the African space policy and strategy documents. We don't hear about the implementation plan and the governance framework. Um, why is this so? So I think we had a few meetings after the resolution was passed by the heads of states in 2016. Uh, and you'll recall you're part of the working group as well. We had put together a work plan in terms of what were the next steps, including the governance framework and so on. But I think the working group, the African Union Space Working Group, was largely constituted or by with uh, technical experts. There were experts from government and from the agency, but that mix 
of technical experts and you know, officials from different government entities was quite uh, advantageous in a way that it allowed us to do the work at a technical level. Okay. And I think we kept to the technical domain. But when the policy and the strategy was approved, I think there was a lot of politicking that was starting to happen in terms of shoving and pushing. Uh, you know, we, we seem to have lost track of the fact that once you have the policy, you have the strategy, you, do, you define the governance framework, then you put an implementation plan together, and then you start to work towards an agency. So the structure of the agency follows from the strategy. Okay. Once the strategy is done, the implementation is on the table, then you know what the agency should look and feel like. But when we put the policy and the strategy on the table, there suddenly was a switch in gears because of, as I said, the politics to now go and set up an agency almost immediately. So the track or the momentum that the working group um, uh, sort of uh, was successful with was suddenly disrupted. And I think in 2017, I realized that we were fighting against the politics and I actually stepped down as a chair at that point in time. Uh, I could see the writing on the wall. This was not the way to do it. Um, you know, some of the things that were happening was happening despite us giving advice. And to the contrary, things started to happen uh, against the advice that we were proposing. So things started to go pear shape. And I think this is why, one of the reasons why since the policy and strategy was approved in January 2016, we're still now yet to see the agency up and running. And, that, and that's a very sad reality. So I think Africa could have been way ahead if we had followed that process. Um, we would have had an implementation plan. We would have had a governance framework. We would, as a working group, pushed on ensuring that all of the aspects of the agency, given our understanding from policy, strategy, implementation, governance, to then hand over that uh, valuable piece of work to the agency once it was established. But all of that was disrupted because of the politics of the agency. So it appears so for the at continental level, uh, the working group was to develop four framework instruments, the national, the policy, the strategy, the implementation plan, and the governance framework. Do you need yes. such frame, such mechanisms or instruments at the national level also? Yes, you do. Uh, so even in South Africa, once we develop a policy and strategy, we had to define a business case for the agency. And the business case includes the, the business model. And we worked quite extensively, even before the agency was established, in, in terms of what the structure should look like. Okay. And when all of that work was done, we had packaged it, and a board of directors was uh, then selected for the agency. And all of this work was then handed over to the board to say, here's some of the preliminary work that we had done, and this is where we think the agency should be heading. The board then applied its independence uh, in terms of strategic thinking, what it thought should uh, the agency function should look like. But the baseline was more baseline studies were already done. And I think we had given the board some leeway to, to you know, tweak. But by and large, most of the uh, important work had already been done. So th that in itself shows how the governance sort of works, that even as a ministry, you don't hold on to the work and say, thou shall implement exactly as we uh, defined it. We actually gave the board of directors of the agency latitude to say, we don't agree with A, B, and C. And obviously there's consultations and discussions around that. And then we come to a point where we agree and then we move forward. So that's kind of governance at work. Uh, and that's essentially what happened in South Africa. It was, a, I think for the first year at least, the board and the ministry were engaged quite uh, intensely in terms of making sure the agency was rightly positioned before we could move forward. And in that same uh, summit decision, the heads of states urged uh, member states and other stakeholders to uh, mobilize domestic resources uh, 
and implement the space policy and strategy. So what in your what in your assessment is the state of implementation of the African space policy and strategy now? So, so let's go back to that recommendation. And, I'll, as the, and that recommendation was essentially saying, you, the African Union Space Working Group, you had done this work in terms of defining the policy and the strategy. Now take it a bit further in terms of governance and implementation plan and come back to us. Okay. That resolution has never been realized. There's no governance framework. There's no implementation plan that has gone back to the African Union of State. And I think uh, that's where the single point failure actually lies, is that we have not committed to ensuring that that happens. We've jumped ahead to set up the agency rather than meeting the resolution of the heads of state. And I think the recommendation the heads of state actually made was the right one in terms of governance, implementation plan before we set up the agency. Now, you recall when we put a few meetings after the 2016 decision to adopt the policy and strategy, we had put the work plan together and a number of the agencies in the room had started to earmark experts from their own institutions to form part of a technical subcommittee that can take different work streams forward. And I think we had nominated from different agencies uh, for those experts to sit in that subcommittee. But even that subcommittee was not realized because suddenly the focus was completely diverted uh, as opposed to ensuring the technical aspects was, was put, put in place. So there were some resources already starting to come through. And I think we are trying to build this program from the bottom up. But the politics that coming from the top down was what disrupted a lot of these things. And I think that's where the working group sort of slowly fizzled out and dismantled itself. Um, yeah, unfortunately. But at the national level, and of course at the continental level, we cannot rule out politics when it comes to public policy. So yeah. the space working group, did they not take uh, cognizance of politics that could come in in terms of implementing their mandate? I think we did. Uh, so if you recall how the working group was established, there was a resolution, I think from the ministers of science and technology. Uh, I think it was MCOS, the African Ministers <laughs> Committee on Science and Technology, who when they had recommended for the establishment of the African Union Space Working Group, they had ensured that the working group was constituted from, uh, so Africa is divided into five regions or what we call the regional economic communities. And we had to ensure that there were two countries for each REC or regional economic community, committee or community that was represented in the working group. And that was to ensure that there was a, the, the politics was sort of taken care of to ensure that different regions or RECs was the interest was represented. And I think when the working group was established and started its work, there was convergence. Even the different regions were starting to think along the same lines. And that was quite good in terms of the work that we had done. And you recall, you know, the resolution to set up the working group was at the very end of 2012. I think the first meeting started to happen in 2013. Um, the policy and the strategy was done by 2015. And that's in a spate of 18 to 24 months, essentially. Now, if you think of policies and strategies that are being developed in Africa, they take years. But this working group had worked you know, quite hard to get these policies and strategies on the table. And we had done it in record time. And that was because of the commitment and the alignment and convergence that we're seeing in the working, which I thought was extremely useful. I mean, yeah. having, um, you know, facilitated a lot of these conversations and the technical work sessions, it was that, you know, the, we would sit from eight in the morning, quite late in the evening, because we were all excited about what we were doing and understanding that we were developing these instruments for the whole of the African continent. And for us, this was a major, major um, undertaking, okay, and the commitment was there. So from that perspective, you know, the, the working group, the success of the working group was taking into account the different political interests as well. But if you read the policy 
itself. It's a, you'll notice that the policy says that the regional economic communities also have a role to play. Okay, so if you look at how the African space program is built up, you have to bootstrap at the national level. So whatever national space programs have in place, do not duplicate at the continental level. Bootstrap that capability and bring that up to par. And then you go to the RECs or the regional economic communities. So you'll have a focus. Uh, let's say in SADC, we started the same conversation. Can we have a SADC space strategy? And we worked in SADC. And I think the uh, ECOWAS started to do the same. So the different RECs were starting to do the same. So that's now the different political interests sort of kicking in. So I think the political interest was taken into account, but it's the, the higher level political uh, interest. When I consider, um, you know, when you're looking at engaging and negotiating at a bilateral level, there are three aspects that one needs to consider when you're looking at states in Africa. One is sovereignty boosting. Okay, so some countries will push hard to ensure their sovereign interests are pushed at the negotiating table. Okay, so that's sovereignty. Other countries might have a more liberal approach. So you, when you see, like, for example, what's happening at the Rex, like SEDEC, when SEDEC sort of convenes, it says we need a common strategy for industrialization. So that's a form of liberalization. Okay, so that's the second aspect. The third aspect, is failed states, where states have very poor governance. And it's very difficult to have them in a negotiating table because their negotiating hand is very weak because of the weakened governance that they have at a national level. So you have to take into account those different dimensions as well when you're looking at the politics in Africa. And then you have to look at it from you know, the colonization point of view as well. Africa was colonized by different cultures. So you will see, um, you know, there's the uh, Francophone countries, there's the uh, Anglophone countries, and so on. And so even those cultures uh, kind of, when you start to negotiate, there's tension points uh, between those different language uh, barriers as well. So all of that has to be taken into account. And the fact that we are delivered in 18 to 24 months, despite all of these technical and cultural issues, I think it was, you know, the African Union Space Working Group should have been commended for the work that has done. If you look at the decision making, the programs, the different partnerships of the African Union and the member states, do you think the policy and strategy have been the basis uh, or how effective have been the policy and strategy in guiding uh, the decision-making and other program uh, development within the continent? So first of all, I think uh, I should maybe mention this point. When the policy and strategy was approved, there was a number of sort of bilateral engagements. And I think one was with the U.S. Uh, and the African Union Commission. Another one was with Europe and the African Union Commission. And I think from all of those quarters, when they looked at the policy and the strategy, they thought it was phenomenal work that was done by the African experts. So from that perspective, it gives us a sense that Africa was aiming in the right direction. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think uh, we've made progress in terms of the policy and strategy. Um, there's a couple of things that are needed that for a, a continental level space program, which I don't think is necessarily there. So a collective political will. So the decision was taken in 2016 to adopt the policy and strategy. It's now 2022. That collective political gathering should have asked the question, what happened to the work that we had recommended come back to us? None of that, it's, it's, it's just got sucked in somewhere and lost. Okay, so the political will is missing. I also think um, the second aspect is the human capital. We have not consolidated. Remember there was an initiative for the Pan-African University and there were five 
uh, university that was supposed to be established, and one was supposed to be established in South Africa, specifically around the Pan-African University for Space Sciences. That has not happened, um, and primarily because of the hosting agreement between South Africa and the African Union Commission, because some of the requirements for the hosting of the Pan-African University uh, was not realistic in, at a national level. So, for example, giving staff diplomatic immunity, ex, uh, you know, exemptions from taxes, import, export duties, which is highly regulated in South Africa and non-negotiable. Um, and, you know, um, sort of rights of usage of certain infrastructure that was built over time by South Africa you know, those kind of things were sticky issues in the hosting agreement. And that's why we've, we've bogged down in some of the establishments around developing human capital. And I think Africa is suffering in the long run because we don't have those programs. So political world, human capital. The third aspect is on the infrastructure because I think if we had consolidated since 2016 and came around the table, we would have a better view around the infrastructure that we have in Africa. Because central to understanding that discussion is intra-Africa co collaboration. That is very weak. If you look at bilateral agreements between uh, different African countries, it's not as strong as it should be. And as a result, you don't have a lot of collaboration amongst African countries when it comes to space. There are some happening, I should say that as well, but it's not optimal. Okay, so when you're looking at infrastructure, there's a very, there's a severe paucity of infrastructure across Africa to cover the full demand and needs of Africa. So political uh, will, leadership, human capital, infrastructure, and then obviously all of that talks to tech transfer, understanding um, where we are in terms of technology readiness levels and so on. And all of that is, as a consequence, we suffer on that front as well. So I think we haven't necessarily made progress that we should have made since the policy and strategy was adopted by in 2016. And it's going to take very strong leadership to correct that problem as we speak. Thanks. So like you mentioned, um, the, the document adopted in 2016, uh, January, so it's about seven years uh, um, maybe less than by two months since the adoption of documents. Do you yeah. think those documents are due for a review? Um, so the answer is yes or no. Okay. Uh, normally, as a rule of thumb, you should be reviewing um, your policies and strategies every five years. That's what I believe. In fact, we do that in South Africa at an institutional level. In fact, as I was leaving SANSA, we had convened a panel of international experts from Europe, from US, from you know, parts of Africa. And we brought them in and we said, look, the agency has been implementing programs. Can you have a look and see in terms of performance? Do you think we've done well in terms of the resources we had? and the achievements that we have achieved, could we have done things better? And give us a set of recommendations on things we should be looking out for in terms of trends so we can adopt that in the new cycle. Now, we should have done that for Africa by now. Five years is well past uh, the time limit, but you cannot do a review on a program that's not been implemented. I mean, what are you reviewing? Uh, there's nothing to show and nothing concrete on the ground that you can lay your hands on and say, here's what Africa has implemented as a collective. And we think that, that there's performance issues on one, two, and three. We commend three of four, four, five, and six. And we think this is how Africa should move going forward. You can't do that because there's nothing to show on the ground in terms of progress. So unfortunately, I think we've reneged and to be quite honest, I think the citizens of Africa has actually suffered in the long run more than anybody else because you know the, we are holding out on a promise that space science and technology can help deliver and improve the quality of lives, create jobs, 
and so on. Uh, so all of that has been delayed as a result of what I've just explained. So that's unfortunate. So as I said, it should have been reviewed after five years, but on the flip side, there's nothing to review because we haven't actually implemented it as, well, as yet. So that's the reality. Let's talk a bit about the, the space agency. So after the policy and document and strategy were adopted in 2016, the heads of state established the African Space Agency 2018 with the hope that it will become operational uh, by next year, 2023. And in the statute establishing the agency, it says the agency should be an organ of the African Union. Uh, There have been some skepticism from different quarters about um, the viability of the African Space Agency. But of course, since it's been established by the head of state, it appears there's no going back on that. So if you were to advise um, on how the agency could be, could, could be given a good starting, what would the advice be? Yeah, I, I think the issue that you just touched on is, is quite critical in terms of the, um, you know, should the African Space Agency be sitting under the African Union Commission? Um, in my sense, it should not be. I think the African Union Commission needs to be part of the governance framework, but not necessarily in firm control of the African Space Agency. And the reason I say that is because if you look at how the African Union Commission is actually structured at the moment, the member states are actually reneging in terms of their budgetary commitments on an annual basis. And so a lot of the funding that comes into the African Union Commission comes from outside of Africa. Okay. So sometimes the agenda of the African Union Commission might be distorted depending on where the funding is coming. And I don't think that should necessarily be the case for the African Space Program. It should be purely driven by technical need in terms of user requirements on the ground and then ensuring that the technology platforms to deliver on those is actually uh, put in place and not necessarily driven from the outside. And there's quite a number of programs coming from the outside of Africa for Africa. And I think uh, not to uh, show any dissent against those programs, it's not their fault. I think Africa needs to take its own leadership and ensure that even those programs are filtered to a point where it's actually relevant for what Africa needs as well. And I don't think that leadership is necessarily there at the moment. So we've got to fix the problem that we have in, in the African continent. So that's the reality that we are facing at the moment. Uh, to run an agency, is a space agency, is not a trivial matter. It's not just about the budget. It's about having the technical capabilities. It's about having the right infrastructure and having the right governance to make sure that you move in the right direction. And all of those aspects have been missing when we're talking about the continental space program. So that's the unfortunate reality that we're facing. I'm hoping that when we say the agency is coming online in the next, let's say, year or two, that something can be put on the ground that we can say at least it's starting to happen. I'm hopeful. But only time can uh, tell. Yeah. yeah um, so uh, there's a question from the audience that say, talks about um, the advancement in uh, space sciences right now, and um, due to those advancements, emerging technologies, advancement in space also. <laughs> Uh, so do, don't you think the space strategy document needs some fine tuning? Um, the one thing I'm fearful of, Etam, is that you can fine tune the strategy, but if the strategy is not implemented, it doesn't make it doesn't matter. Okay, we have a strategy which is not being implemented. You can fine tune it, and if it's still not implemented, it doesn't make sense. I thought the strategy that we had developed as the African Union Space Working Group that was approved in January 2016 was actually to get our foot in the door as the African country. Remember, you don't develop a strategy for indefinite. You develop it over timelines, okay? So you've got to develop 
a base uh, baseline in terms of infrastructure, human capital, making sure the government governance is correctly framed and so on. And then you start to build on top of that over time. And that's when the tweaking starts to happen in terms of trends, what Africa is good at, what is the niche market that Africa should be focusing on, but rather than trying to do everything in Africa. Um, once you set up that base, then you can decide in which direction to tweak the strategy. The base is missing. So unfortunately, if you tweak it, you're tweaking it without any context. And that's what I'm fearful of, that when you start to fiddle with these instruments without having implemented any aspect of it, it might be a futile exercise to at the end. Still on the, ag on the agency, I remember there, there's this paper which you wrote that Africa should not follow the European model as the ESI, ESI model of the agency. And yeah. um, I think um, about the space expert at African Union has also said in several forums that the agency, the role of the agency is to coordinate space activities in Africa. So how should the agency interface? You also, you also mentioned about the sovereignty of member states. So how should yeah. the agency interface in terms of space activities, space governance, and um, uh, giving attention to international obligations? How should the agency interface with the member states, um, national agencies, and programs? Yeah. No, thanks for that. Uh, maybe just to give some context in that paper, and maybe just to also acknowledge that you're also the co-author. You and I wrote the paper many, many years ago. And I think the gist of why we said that Africa should not follow the European model, I think it was two or three different reasons. One, there is, if you follow what's happening in Europe, you have the European Space Agency, and then you have a space agency in terms of the European Commission, which has just been established. Okay. Um, the sort of the focus of the European Commission was more on the defense on the missile side, and ESA was more from the scientific aspects coming through. But there seems to be a disconnect between the Commission and the European Space Agency from a governance point. They seem to have different tracks. If you look at the member states, they're not one and the same, so the governance is different. Um, and there's many different papers written by even European experts uh, around these tension points between the Commission and the agency. Uh, if you think about it, we're setting up an African space agency. But if you look at the work of the African Union Commission, at least 60% of the work is defense focused. It's around peace and stability in Africa. Okay? So if you follow the European model, you're going to get that dichotomy as well in Africa. And we should avoid that. Okay? Um, the second aspect, which ESA follows, is a just ritual principle. So if member states put in funding into a coffer, a central coffer, and then it expects that certain percentage, uh, a, a matching percentage should be in contract value to the national companies, or the space sector. That model cannot work in Africa because first of all, you have to make, each member state has to be making contributions into a central pot. But in terms of extracting the contracts into the national space program, you have to have infrastructure. You have to have experts on the ground. This is very weak on the African continent. There's very few African countries that have the capability. So when countries put in money to central coffer, then it's only those states that have the capabilities that are gonna benefit from it. Where other states will benefit is obviously on the user requirements perspective of the products and services. But that's not certain at the moment because nothing is moving. So we have to be very guarded in terms of how we piece all of this together. And so that model does not work for Africa. So what is relevant for Africa? And I think Peter Martinez had actually written a paper guarding against rushing towards setting up an African space agency. His central thesis was Africa should focus on intra-Africa collaboration, intracontinental collaboration as a basis for building that base uh, you know, requirements for an African space program, whether it's infrastructure, human capital, and so on. 
that through this intra-Africa collaboration and these projects and these flagship projects, we can then build up what's required for Africa. And I think I, I kind of agree with that sentiment uh, as well, because that's one sure way. And I think you're aware we try to set up uh, something very similar for, for Africa um, in terms of a, um, a committee of African space institutions. Okay. That did not fly in, fly um, because there was still some politics around. And a lot of what that was coming from when, I think it was at the same time when the African Space Agency was being established. And the countries that were actually wanting to host the space agency saw this as a threat. Actually, you need a top-down, bottom-up approach for an African space program. You cannot only have a top-down. Because okay? as I said, even the policy says you have to bootstrap what's at the national, regional level to give effect to the uh, continental space program. So you need that bottom-up approach as well. And this is what this committee was meaning to do. It wasn't uh, meant to go against the space agency. So that said, the space agency should be looking at coordination, uh, taking all of these flagship projects and coordinating them and filling the gaps to give a consolidated picture in terms of what the strategy is requiring for the African continent. And that is now currently missing because we don't have the intra Africa collaboration from the bottom up, neither do we have the top down kind of coordination coming through. So there's nothing. We're not clapping our hands in Africa, mm. unfortunately. One more thing about the policy document, the, the policy and strategy document. Uh, it said four thematic areas for focus um, earth observation, satellite communication, navigation and positioning, and um, space science or space exploration. But if you look at recent developments going on in space right now, in orbit uh, services, uh, rendezvous and proximity operations, and of course, emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, it appears there are some major application uh, gaps or lapses within the policy and strategy document. So by hindsight now, um, what would you have, I mean, what do you think you would have done better with respect to the policy and strategy documents, or what if you have the opportunity of changing it? What are the things you want to see changed? Yeah, um, to be quite honest, Etam, I think the policy and strategy document that we developed develop is still relevant now. Okay, so rather than changing it, I think there's a need for effective leadership to start implementing what we had defined in the policy and strategy. Here's the reality that's happening on the African continent. The, the continental agency is still coming online. The intra-Africa collaboration between the different agencies is kind of weak at the moment. But what's happening at the moment, you're seeing the industry in Africa, it's kind of blossoming and it's starting to fill up the gap that the agencies are missing nationally and continentally. Because if you see the Africa EO challenge that's been running, I mean, we've done this from South Africa perspective, but this year we've partnered with Kenya, I think Rwanda as well. <clears throat> so the number of African countries that have an interest in that challenge is also uh, increasing. But what we've seen, for example, last year, the top two winners of the top three came from Kenya. And the reason for that is that Kenya has invested quite heavily in ICT, you know, high performance computing. Uh, so that's beginning to show in the downstream. Uh, Quite nicely. So it's also starting to demonstrate that certain African countries have niche capabilities that we need to exploit. And the industry is starting to take that on because there's now quite a few industry players that are coming through um, and filling that gap. We see that in South Africa as well. Uh, there's the, the industry is just burgeoning um, quite uh, exponentially. And in Africa, we've seen that all over the place. So I think what that would then mean is that the role of the agencies uh, has to change. And we've done that in South Africa. We've changed the business model of the space agency in South Africa based on the fact that it was a philosophical approach where 
the agency's responsibility is essentially to look after the backbone of infrastructure, the space infrastructure. So satellites, ground segments, data segments, and pushing the products and services. Okay, That's your base infrastructure. But it's not the role of the industry, uh, the agency, to actually deliver across the value chain or across that uh, infrastructure chain. Okay, When you're building a satellite, you have the infrastructure which the agency can, like the assembly integration testing facility, which can be in the agency, um, but the agency does not build a satellite. It prime contracts to industry. Okay, So you're stimulating the industry in the upstream. The same with the downstream. The agency should not be building products and services. It should be looking after the fundamental research that's required at a national level, defining those, let's say, strategy for satellite engineering or developing um, products and services uh, pipeline. But it should be contracting industry, other public sectors to come in. So then you're stimulating a whole ecosystem around that value chain. Okay? So the role of the agency is completely shifting. And you see this in NASA as well. And in Africa, I think there's a bit of resistance to move in that direction. We've done it in South Africa, but I think the rest of Africa, they're slow to follow. Uh, but I think the industry over time is going to overtake uh, the way the uh, agencies operate. So it's also time, I think, for national space agencies to reflect on their particular role in terms of the national ecosystems. But they're also going to come back to in terms of the role of the African Space Agency uh, in terms of the African space industry and how that kind of pans out. So all of this is kind of moving as we speak and nobody's waiting for you know, just the African Space Agency to come up, to be up and running. I think work is already being taken by the industry to fill the gap. So after you left um, the South African Space Agency, Sansa, you picked up a role as uh, the advisor to the Saudi Space Commission. Uh, I, I know you're a captain right now, but you'll soon be leaving for um, Riyadh. Uh, as the advisor to the Saudi Space Commission, what are your functions specifically? I mean, yeah, so I won't talk about the programmatic focus of the uh, Saudi Space Commission. Um, but I think you might be aware about two or three weeks ago, there was a royal decree. Okay. And the royal decree essentially said that there's now going to be a Supreme Space Council. So this is the level of His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, and ministers sitting at a governance level. So they look at the approval of the strategy, the st approval of the policies. So the governance perspective, you've got a high-level political leadership and political commitment, okay, which is very, very clear. And then there's a, another tier below that. So on the one side, we have what is called the Communication Space Technology Commission. It's a regulatory body that's going to regulate, let's say, on the ITU side and the UN treaties and convention side, but also uh, putting together some regulatory aspects in terms of building the ecosystem. Okay, So it's very regulatory policy strategy. So the development of the policy and strategy will happen at the commission goes up to the Supreme Council for approval, but the Saudi Space Commission will be dissolved and will be replaced by a Saudi Space Agency, which is the implementation of So you can see the governance structure is starting to evolve as we speak. There is a draft, let's say, a strategy that's currently going through the approval process. We think that's going to happen in quarter one. In fact, a lot of the technical aspects of uh, that strategy has been taken care of. There's general consensus, understanding, and agreement around that. And I must admit, what's in the strategy is quite ambitious. It's extremely ambitious. And from my perspective and where I'm sitting, that's going to be putting Saudi Arabia on the map in terms of the top 10 or top five contenders uh, in terms of positioning globally. Um, so my role is essentially looking at the space agency, given my experience around building policy, the strategy, looking at the business model of the agency. So we have to make sure, now that we have a policy, we have a space policy, we have a space strategy. So I'm working on the structural aspects of the agency. We're going through a whole process. And it's quite an involved process, I should mention. It's not thumbs-upping that this is the structure we think the agency should have. 
you have to take the policy, the strategy, dissect it, break it down, and rebuild it in terms of what the institutional framework should look like. And that exercise is quite involved. And so we're just concluding on that work as we speak. And that will essentially tell you what the structure, the optimal structure of the agency should look like to deliver on all of these aspects of the strategy. So it's quite exciting work, but it's quite involved. And at the same time, there's quite a number of missions that we are working on that by the time the strategy is actually announced, uh, we'll also announce all of these initiatives as well. So that's what we're working on. And I think it's now already in the public domain. There will be two astronauts launched uh, in the first, second quarter of next year. So that's part of the strategy as well. So a lot of lead time that we are using up in terms of building the baseline that's needed in terms of ensuring that we have the right agency to deliver on the strategy. And I think, as I was pointing out, this was the approach that Africa should have taken. Uh, and I'm seeing this happening in Saudi Arabia, which is amazing. The, mo the momentum of the Saudi space um, program or Saudi space activities, is, is it um, motivated by the progress made by the uh, United Arab Emirates, UAE, uh, in their space science program? No, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's probably the same policy driver as the UAE. Uh, it's diversification of their economy. So that comes into question because when you are a country that's producing, you know, oil for the rest of the world, oil is not uh, clean energy in any way. Okay, so at some point in time, given the technology drive to go to clean energy, renewable energy, and so on, we're going to see that that economic shift happen uh, away from oil and coal and so on. So when you have the opportunity to actually look at other economic sectors, um, then you have to sort of pull through in terms of diversifying your economy. And by the way, I should mention, even in South Africa, we had a 10-year innovation plan. We have five grand challenges that we looked at. Um, we had uh, biotech and health. Okay? We had uh, climate change. We had human and social dynamics. And then obviously the, the energy aspects. And then the fifth one was space. Now, your aeronautics, or let's say your aerospace industry, is quite key to what we call the knowledge economy. So when you look at it from a science policy perspective, when you want to move from away from natural-based economy, where you're just mining, producing natural resources, you move to other countries, you add value, and you then import them back. You want to ensure that the optimum value is realized in country to improve the quality of life of the citizens, create economic opportunities. So you want a lot of that to be staying in the country. So the aeronautics or the aerospace sector is one of those sectors that it's it actually you don't need to think through it much to understand that it is a vital component to the knowledge economy. So satellite communications. And by the way, there was a big conference in Saudi Arabia called Connecting the Skies. Okay. So this is non-terrestrial uh, networks that they're looking at. And so how do we connect? So it, it, it turns out there's almost 3 billion people that don't have connectivity at the moment as we speak. So how do we ensure that those citizens are also now connected? So this is now bringing in the, you know, the Leo constellations in uh, and so on. And that's all coming from space. Okay. If you're talking about the knowledge economy, it means that if you want to push the knowledge economy more from a services economy, it means that knowledge has to flow in your economic system, okay? in your system of innovation. And the backbone for the flow of that knowledge in your ecosystem is your communications backbone. Okay? And if that communications backbone is weak, where you don't have proper connectivity, and that's the reality in Africa, that means you cannot push the knowledge economy. So space, from that perspective, in terms of connectivity, is extremely crucial in terms of transforming some of our economic structures from natural economy to the knowledge economy. So again, it's a no-brainer 
that you have to invest in space. If you want to make the transition from natural economy, like your oil-based economy, to a more knowledge economy, and you need space to do that. Thanks, Ed. So, some years ago, there were efforts to establish a pan-Arab space agency with headquarters in Egypt, but it appears this did not gain traction. Uh, more recently, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, have successfully facilitated the establishment of the Arab Space Cooperation Group, which includes some countries in North Africa. So do you think this is a case of divided interest by the North African countries aligning with the Pan-Arab uh, um, Agency or Alliance and also being part of the African Space Agency? I... It, it did bother me initially, but I think there's a different way of looking at this. So the Arab states are obviously looking for alliances. So the Gulf states, as an example, is naturally the, the collective alliance. Okay? So having Arab countries sort of coming together and collaborating kind of makes sense. The fact that you have some Arab countries in North Africa is neither here nor there. It's just bringing that common interests and ensuring that you have proper collaboration. So the UAE is part of that, and the UAE is taking leadership. Saudi Arabia is part of that. You have Morocco, Sudan, Egypt, and so on. Um, so that also now brings into sharp focus the MENA regions, the Middle East and North Africa region. Okay? So it's not just the Arab states. So as Africa is developing and Arabs, um, the Middle East is sort of coming through you're going to find much more synergies between Africa and the Middle East. And in fact, um, if I can safely say this uh, from the Saudi Arabian perspective, we're also looking at, as we're building up our ecosystem, what is the potential for collaboration with Africa? Okay. And that's a conversation that we will probably be looking into in the near future as well. So I think this all bodes well for possible collaboration, creates more opportunity, and we are all developing countries. So I think it means that developing the focus on developing countries is going to be elevated rather than just a few countries that have you know, developed countries taking the lead in terms of space uh, globally. So I think this is a huge opportunity that we cannot afford to miss. From, from your work with the Arab space industry, uh, what policy changes um, could Africa as a whole and African countries individually do differently that could help the African space industry to grow? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if this is a question around policy, to be quite honest. I think it's a, it's a question around leadership. Uh, you, I'm not so sure that our policies in Africa are necessarily different from that of the Middle East. What I think is different is effective leadership. Okay. Uh, when there's a, com a directive given from the top, everybody's following through to make sure it happens. Um, to be quite honest, uh, if you look at the oil reserves in the UAE, I think, Afri well, you know for a fact that Africa has bigger oil reserves than the U UAE. But if you look at the UAE's development for the last few years and that of uh, states in Africa that have oil reserves, it's very different. And why is that? It's because of leadership. What you do with the profits that you get from this kind of economic activity, it's leadership. It's not around policies. You can have the best policies in the world, but if poor leadership means that you're not going to get the impact that you're looking for. So my sense, it's more leadership than policy. Okay, one last question. Um, the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit is coming up in less than two weeks. Uh, yes. There's also a planned U.S. Africa Space Forum on the first day. What will be your core messages for the leaders from uh, both regions, both from the U.S. and from Africa? What will be your core messages to the to the forum and to the summit? Okay, so it's it's. It's a given that the U.S. is a global leader. Uh, and so a lot of what they're doing is on the cutting edge. Okay. So Africa cannot in any way compete with that. 
So we've got to see from our perspective, what is our niche capabilities that we can offer? Okay. And how can we create flagship projects around these touch points in terms of collaboration? I think we're seeing that in some way or the other. Unfortunately, the only examples I have is in South Africa at the moment. Maybe it's because I don't have the full scale knowledge elsewhere. But just to give you a sense, the Deep Space Network, um, it's a geographic advantage to have one in South Africa, uh, given all the lunar missions that are coming online. So that uh, agreement has been signed with NASA, uh, and now we're looking at building that capability in South Africa to support all of the lunar missions going forward. We have a new space weather center that was launched about a month ago. It's part of the global network for the aviation sector. And again, the, there's only two countries that are holding um, space weather centers. All of the, I think there's about five centers. The other three are consortiums. So South Africa hosts its own center and then for the whole of the African continent. And the U.S. as a country hosts its, uh, the other center. I think there's two European consortium and then there's a Russian China consortium as well. So even there, U.S., Africa, remember this center that's built in South Africa is not meant for South Africa, it's meant for the, Af the entire African continent. Um, so I think those are the touch points I'm, I'm talking about, is can we find more of those touch points that we can build a collaboration around between U.S. and Africa? And I think there is huge potential for doing that. Thank Thanks. Dr. Musami, thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to having another opportunity of uh, engaging with you. Thanks, Etan. It's a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. And we look, join us for another edition of um, the program. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.